Good evening, everyone, and Happy New Year. I'm glad to um, have you join us again as we continue our plod through um, the book of Luke. And we're going to be looking a bit at chapter 22 today, and things are going to start getting quite dense and um, quite intense as, as we reach here the last few days of Jesus's life. And there's going to be a lot to unpack. So we might not move particularly fast through the text from here on out, um, but we'll see how far we get. Um, so given what we've got to cover, let's go ahead and dive right in. So in chapter 22, um, here we are, we have, now the festival of the unleavened bread, which is called the Passover, was near. Chief priests and scribes were looking for a way to put Jesus to death, for they were afraid of the people. Um, and that could be they were afraid that the people would side with Jesus, or they were just afraid that there would be a riot, and then again, chaos, Roman soldiers coming in to pacify them, death, destruction, all of that. Then Satan entered into Judas called Iscariot, who was one of the twelve. He went away and conferred with the chief priests and officers of the temple police about how he might betray him to them. They were greatly pleased and agreed to give him money. So he consented and began to look for an opportunity to betray him to them when no crowd was present. And now this is interesting, and I wonder if this is just practically. Um, they could have, you know, arrested Jesus for any time. They didn't need Judas to finger him because... Um, they knew who Jesus was. I mean, it's not like it was a mystery um, who Jesus is, but I wonder if it's just that they're trying, they want to arrest him, but they really want to avoid any sort of crowd or any sort of scene. Um, and so what they need Judas is less to incriminate Jesus or to point him out, um, but maybe to um, let them know a time when they can come and arrest him quietly um, or as quietly as they can. Um, but anyway, uh, and there's also the, the detail that Luke has here. Then Satan entered into Judas called Iscariot. And now there's some debate about Judas's motivation or his character, whether or not Judas is redeemable or um, completely sort of um, left out in the cold, uh, as it were, according to um, grace and forgiveness and all of that sort of thing, or whether or not Judas just makes a mistake or what, what motivates him. Luke says here that Satan enters into him and whatever Luke means by that, he's implying that there's some sort of outside force, that it's not that Judas is some kind of evil character who has you know, been kind of laying in wait the whole time plotting, but that um, something outside of Judas and outside of the Twelve um, kind of causes this. Um, do with that what you will. Then came the day of unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. So Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover meal for us, that we may eat it. They asked him, Where do you want us to make preparations for it? Listen, he said to them, When you have entered the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him into the house he enters, and say to the owner of the house, The teacher asks you, Where is the guest room? Where, I, where may I eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs already furnished. Make preparations for us there. So they went and found everything as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover meal. So it's a bit of a, I don't know, what we might consider kind of a magic trick from Jesus. He sort of predicts that there's going to be a man with a jug of water. In any case, it's it's um, one of those moments where they kind of go, oh, gosh, I don't know Jesus. And Jesus is like, I just go to it. Um, and there's also the elements of hospitality there that their city would be full for the Passover and um, whether or not there would be much room or many rooms or that locals would would they would feel um, obliged to welcome people in and to share the meal with them um, because you wanted to share it within the city, even though they were staying outside the city and people would have stayed in kind of roundabout villages and things. Um, you wanted to have the Passover meal inside the city. When the hour came, he took his place at the table and the apostles with him. He said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it 
until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. That's what the NRSV has, and there's a wee note that says some texts might say, I will not eat it again. And that's probably a little bit of an addition just to clarify what Jesus probably means here as we get in some of the other Gospels, as he's going to eat Passover with them and have the cup and have the bread, um, but he's not going to do it again until um, the end um, when everything is kind of brought together and... and uh, he is with us um, in the end. Um, and so that's probably what he means. He will not eat it again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And that could be his own death and resurrection um, as he does eat with them and break bread with them after he raises. Some people might take that to mean um, the ultimate end of all things. But um, because he eats and he does break bread with them and they recognize him later here in Luke on the road to Emmaus, um, it, it could very well be that he is not going to, to have this until the, the fulfillment is um, after his resurrection. Uh, then he took a cup. After giving thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves, for I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Then he took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he did the same with the cup after supper, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. But see, the one who betrays me is with me, and his hand is on the table. For the Son of Man is going as it, had been, as it has been determined, but woe to that one by whom he is betrayed. Then they begin to ask one another which one of them it would be who would do this. Of course, we know it's going to be Judas. Um, a wee note on this. Um, there is one tiny little word that I want to um, maybe bring out some interesting kind of meaning behind here um, in, in the original language. So um, not in not every gospel do we have when Jesus talks about the cup. This is the cup that is poured out for you as, as the new covenant in my blood. Sometimes he just says as a covenant. Um but I want to talk a little bit about that word new, because it's a really interesting word. So for English, we have the word new. It means something new. It is not old. It is new. Um, in Greek, there are two different words for new, for something being new. And a really good explanation for that is the idea of something like money. So I could have a five pound note. Remember the old, um, I don't know if they were, they were kind of clothish, but the old ones versus the new kind of silicon clear plasticky ones. Um, you can have an old fiver and a new fiver, right? And they are both um, paper money. They're both notes, um, but one is old, one is new, right? That's one word for new in Greek, and that is the word neos, or where we also get neo, that prefix that we use, like um, something being new is neo something or other. Um, then there is a different kind of new. So you have um, old money being a fiver, and then new money being a plastic card, or you could even go even further new um, with your phone or with your watch, if you have a smart watch, um, where you can pay with just a tap of your card or a tap of your phone. So you have old money, a fiver, a paper note, something that you have in your hand, and new money, a card or even Apple Pay or, or your watch or your phone, something new of a completely different kind. It's not just an old fiver and a new fiver or a crumpled fiver and a fresh fiver. Um, but it's actually new of a, of a kind of re redone kind. And that's the word kainos. And that is the word that Luke uses here for new covenant. It is a kainos covenant, um, which that might indicate without taking it too far, because sometimes we can get um, kind of overworked about the um, the little implications of some of these words when language sometimes just exists and it's not necessarily some kind of secret code. Um, what the difference between netos and kainos can kind of give us the flavor of in terms of this covenant is that this covenant in Jesus's blood is not just a refreshed covenant. It's not just taking the old covenant and just sort of dusting it off, ironing it out, or, or even just making a new one, but it's basically the same thing, but it's new. Remember the whole um, kind of central thrust of a lot of the New Testament and a lot of Paul's writings is that this old covenant was under the law and it was doomed to fail, but now there is a new covenant. 
And so this new covenant as a kainos covenant is new of a different kind. It's completely refreshed, completely redone, completely rethought, and it's new in that way. It's um, fresh and it's redone. And this is how it can come to be so much more inclusive and open and expansive rather than a um, a kind of covenant that gets tied down in detail and sacrifice, especially, and also in um, simple, like kind of ethnic heritage or, or conversion. The, the, um, the new covenant in Jesus's blood opens it up so much more new. So it is still a covenant between humanity and God, but it is new of a new kind, new of a different kind. So that's um, my kind of spiel on that word, tiny word new there, um, which I think is is pretty interesting. So um, let us um, go ahead and pause there. Um, we've gotten through 23 verses of chapter 22, and I think that's a pretty good place to, to let it um, rest there until next week. So thanks for joining us, everyone. Have a good week.